so am I the only one on YouTube who hasn't covered this topic yet? Either way, better late than never. Try to tell that to the Reaper. Sides used in combat seem to capture people's imagination, whether it's in anime or various role-playing games or historical fiction, etc. The scythe is sort of the quintessential exotic badass weapon or improvised weapon. But first off, let's actually talk about standard scythes as in the agricultural tool. I don't have an agricultural scythe, I just have this crazy thing here that I designed and that was made by Jeremy Lethul. The link to his page is down below in case you want to commission something equally crazy or more conventional. Look at dictionaries, there are a few different definitions like a tool used for cutting crops such as grass or corn with a long curved blade at the end of a long pole attached to one or two short handles or an agricultural implement consisting of a long curving blade fastened at an angle to a handle for cutting grass, grain, etc. by hand. A tool with a long sharp curved blade and a long handle held in two hands used especially to cut long grass. Believe it or not, while doing research for this video Video, I actually found an article about the perfect form of scythes on a Swedish archaeology website. While the earliest scythes had relatively short blades, they were lengthened over time, which improves their cutting ability, but eventually the blade was mounted at a right angle, or close to a right angle at least, to not affect the balance too much. If you just put more and more blade on the handle, it's going to get top heavy. So this is a way to limit the effect of that because uh, you have to keep in mind that a scythe, an agricultural scythe, is meant to be used pretty much all day for hours and hours of just cutting hay or crops over and over again. So you want for work, you want something that is as easy as possible to use. Of course, for fighting, that is also a consideration. You don't want something that requires a lot of energy either way. But for a tool, it's even more important. In the Middle Ages, they added an extra handle to the shaft, which is called a snath on a scythe. And then eventually it became two handles. And in order to be as efficient as possible, the snath has to be adjusted to the user. The distance between the two handles is very important. The overall length of the snath matters. Um, in terms of shape, it can be either straight or curved, which has pros and cons each. Depends on the terrain, whether you're scything on fairly even terrain or if it's rocky or uneven. Longer sized blades are generally made thicker to prevent bending and vibration. And generally heavier blades are for cutting grain and other crops, while shorter, lighter blades are usually for cutting hay. I found some statistics about scythes in the early 20th century, and it seems like most of them were generally in the range of 70 to 100 centimeters and between 600 and 800 grams, but there were also shorter, lighter ones. And apparently farmers from different areas had different opinions on what makes a good scythe. You know, some preferred longer, heavier blades, others preferred lighter ones. Modern scythes have a tang with a knob that fits into a hole in the snath, and then a ring clam slides over and is tightened. There's some variation in shape. Some scythe blades can be strongly curved. There are some medieval depictions showing pretty extreme cases of very strongly curved scythes, and also some later paintings that show the same. Other scythes are almost perfectly straight. When it comes to using a scythe as a weapon, people have pointed out that the blade is too thin to allow for that. And I used to think that too, but some scythe blades can actually be fairly thick. The real problem is the thickness of the edge because it tapers to a very thin wafer. Now, the edge angle is actually per side between seven and nine degrees usually. That's literally like a razor blade. Uh, for comparison, kitchen knives tend to be between 15 and 20, and swords usually between 20 and 30, sometimes 35, depending on 
the exact type and the purpose. Once the scythe blade has dulled to the point where you can't hone it with a stone anymore or it has become damaged, you actually have to peen it by hammering the edge and drawing the material out to make it nice and thin. That way you can fix any damage that might be there. An extremely fine edge like that is of course excellent for cutting light soft material, which it is designed for obviously. If you used an actual agricultural scythe in combat, the edge would most likely bend, roll and chip very easily because it's just not designed for cleaving through bone or meeting other metal weapons or wooden shields, all of that. However, you could modify it, of course. Regrind the, the blade a little bit to take off the thinnest part of the edge and just leave it thicker and grind it at a different angle. And that's exactly what happened in history at times when sides were taken and modified to a greater or lesser extent and then adopted for fighting. There were actual war sides. They were sometimes seen in peasant uprisings or when arming civilian militias. And what people did was to remove the blade and remount it upright because that is a lot more practical for fighting and I'll talk about that later when discussing the practical aspects. So just like with regular sides there was quite a bit of variation in blade length and thickness and degree of curvature, all of that. They were generally used between the 16th and the 19th century, although if you look at the guisarm, which is a type of medieval pole arm, if you look at it as basically a war scythe with added prongs, that would be an earlier form. It's usually classified as a different weapon, but if you look at it, that's basically it. War scythe that has additional hooks or prongs attached to it, and that would be found as early as the 11th century, apparently. So scythes were sometimes used on the battlefield. One example is the Battle of Raklavice in 1794, which was a Polish uprising against the Russians, and 3,000 men were armed with muskets, bayonets, and sabers, and 2,000 peasants were armed with scythes and pikes. And those peasants were not just cannon fodder, they in fact managed to capture Russian cannon. So they must have been reasonably effective. Here's another picture of Polish scythemen. And there's even some documentation of Polish formal military drills in the early 20th century. So it shows some ways to, to cut and parry with the scythe. So apparently this is a Polish thing in particular and was still used pretty late. And some war scythes could get ridiculously huge. According to the 1894 An Illustrated History of Arms and Armor, the Austrian Czechist infantry in the 18, mid 18th century used war scythes with blades up to four feet six inches. So it's 137 centimeters. That's essentially an entire longsword attached to the end of a pole. That's crazy. Okay, now onto my favorite part, practical considerations of sides as weapons. So there are certain issues that you face with a, an agricultural scythe. For this design right here, I was basically sticking to the classic reaper scythe, which is quite often fairly strongly curved and, and kind of pointed downward. That presented me with some challenges when using it. I tried this on a zombie head recently, and uh, some people said they were disappointed that I didn't do a decap with it. The problem is I don't think I could have I was looking at it and I was, I was trying to figure out a way to use it effectively for a cut, but I just had to default to using the point because it just doesn't really work terribly well. Now the opposite, you know, more of a war scythe, would be something like the Dacian Falks, as opposed to sitting like this, it would be rotated. And this allows you a lot more options. For one, you can thrust with it. This is of course not ideal for that, but you still have the option of striking with the tip, depending on how strongly forward curved it is, but you can also do a slicing cut or hewing cut, because if somebody struck me with a scythe like this, this would contact the body and the microphone, and there could be 
a follow through here, it could slice to an extent or just hew into the target like that. This on the other hand, don't worry, I'll be careful. If somebody tried to do a slice on me here, basically the point would enter my back before it can actually do anything. Now, the only way you could really cut with this would be kind of a pulling motion, which is very weak. There's no percussive action in it. It would just be a slice. So you wouldn't even be using the leverage to really generate force and drive it in. It's just, I mean, you can hook with it. And in fact, that is shown in Paulus Hector Meyer's manuscript about fighting with sides, just straight up farming tools. Why did he write about that? You can debate that, of course, but it seems like this is one of those cases where one of the fencing masters try to gain traction through exotic techniques. At least that's one possible explanation, because who else taught scythe fighting? Uh, maybe somebody else did, but you have to keep in mind that a manuscript like that is strictly for the higher classes. Uh, books were very expensive in the Renaissance, less so than the Middle Ages, but still very, very expensive and not for the general population. This was not for actual peasants who couldn't even read, and let alone afford a book like that. So this was not for farmers you know, teaching them how to defend themselves against an angry neighbor or something like that. Also, what situation would that be where you run into somebody with a scythe who attacks you while you also have a scythe? That's really more judicial duel sort of shenanigans where you would generally pair the same weapons and it would be a very, you know, regulated, ritualized sort of context. I haven't studied that in detail or tried it out because uh, scythe fighting is difficult to do safely. You definitely can't spar but I haven't experimented with the techniques either. All I can say is they look reasonable. They look like you could use them if you ended up in this unlikely situation. As far as cutting an opponent is concerned, it's generally difficult to do because the shaft just gets in the way. Now you could potentially target limbs with this circular swipe, similar to how hay is cut. Now you could probably nail somebody in the calf with that and then probably cut fairly deep that way. But attacking the body just doesn't really work with this just because of the position of the snaff or pole in this case. So something like this is just much more practical for general fighting, gives you a lot more options. Now, several people pointed out that they were surprised by how effective the scythe was on the zombie head because the entire damn thing just went straight through the head. Now, there is a difference that you have to make between a weapon that does a lot of damage and one that is effective in combat. Because you can have something that is tremendously damaging. For example, if you had a splitting maul, you could do grotesque amounts of damage with that, but it's so large and unwieldy for combat that you would be pretty much screwed if you had to use one. So in designing the scythe, as said, I want to stick to this sort of reaper theme and see what I can do with it. And I decided to make it double-edged to be able to do a cut this way. So a rising false edge slice with the top, because in that case, the handle wouldn't get in the way, of course. And I tried that on tatami mats. Um, it was difficult. It did cut, just not very deeply. I mean, if I messed around with this some more and actually practice with it, I could probably get fairly good at cutting with this side. Um, even then, it is too strongly curved. It would just be way better if I had straightened this out substantially, maybe even made it completely straight or just given the slight curvature. Um, I also put this blade on with the idea, you know, if you cannot use this in certain situations, maybe you could use that 
Now this should be larger to really be effective because you know thrusting with this is just not great. It's very short. You could you could actually cut with this because that is at the right angle or correct angle I should say not a right angle. The only problem is if I tried this. Um, yeah, this, I feel like I might backstab myself. So there are definitely some issues with this. Not the most practical thing I've ever designed, but I wanted to go for coolness anyway. I think I could accomplish that. Jeremy actually recorded some footage of the process of making the scythe, which is pretty interesting. Quite cool. Always need to see something come together. And this was an interesting, unusual approach with the copper and brass pieces here that are related to it. Overall, really nice work. And I definitely appreciate that he did that for me. I also made leather sheath for it. I just traced the shape onto this very thick leather that I had left over and cut it out. Two of those. And then on the sides, just one strip each to act as a spacer. So this way, it fits pretty well. Uh, I, I could definitely finish this. It's still very rough. I just uh, just wanted to get this done to the point where it can be used because this thing, storing this and especially transporting this, is a little nightmarish. It's a rather bulky overall shape and it's got points and sharp edges everywhere. So yeah, definitely good to have this. When it comes to this sort of setup, sickles are actually a lot more effective because they are basically like a war pick. And particularly this one, which has a very thick blade. As you can see, this is really not very suitable for, for cutting, particularly not cutting grass. This is just too thick and not sharp enough. This is basically the opposite of what you have on, on a scythe or sickle. But this is a wicked war pick. I've tried it out a number of times and it just is devastating. It rips straight through all kinds of fabric armor and with minimal effort, this is crazy effective. So that's that's one way to go about it with a sickle or a scythe. Just treat it more like a war pick. Depends on whether or not you really want a war pick. It will just be thicker and, and more of a spike without an edge or you could give it an edge and in some situations that might come in handy. Hooking, of course, is possible with this and just the sheer power, all that force being concentrated on the point is ridiculous. Let that be enough for now. I hope you enjoyed this discussion of sides. Maybe you got some ideas for fantasy designs or maybe you were just entertained. That's what I would hope. And um, thanks for watching. Have a good one, folks.